Okay. Uh, hi, everybody, and welcome to the chapter 14 uh, video. So um, I sort of introduced this when I introduced quantificational schemata last week. Um, and now I'm just going to go into more details of why we need polyadic quantificational schemata. Um, yeah. So this chapter is like all translation, and I'm just going to tell you that um, for some reason, I don't know why, um, but it's like a universal law of logic classes that no one's good at this. Uh, no, no one is good at translating to and from polyadic quantificational schemata. So you'll have to do a few of them on your final exam and on the next learning practice, probably. However, um, they're not going to be nearly as hard as the hardest examples I'm going to give you here. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain why we need polyadic predicates. Um, then I'm just going to go through a bunch of translation examples. And that's sort of all I can do here. There's not really a method for translating, uh, especially when we get to polyadic schemata. Uh, this is one of those things that uh, philosophers will especially argue about these. Um, yeah, so try to pay attention to the examples and hopefully that will help. Um, yeah, I, I feel very bad that I can't give you better instructions for how to do this, but they quite simply don't exist to my knowledge. Um, okay, so to explain why we need polyadic quantificational schemata, let's look at this sentence right here. If there is an apple pie, then everyone who is hungry wants to eat it. And so here's a translation key, px for x is a pie, ax for x is made with apples, uh, or is apple, uh, hy for y is hungry, uh, and then ex for x is a thing that everyone who is hungry wants to eat. And, you know, that's not wrong. Um, Exactly. Uh, and if we wanted to translate it like that, we would trans, it would be something like this. So uh, if there exists something that is a pie and is uh, made out of apples, then uh, everyone who is hungry wants to eat it. So uh, for every Y, if uh, Y is hungry, then they want to eat that pie. Okay. And, you know, that's not wrong. I mean, at least in the sense that it also wouldn't be wrong to translate this whole sentence as P. It's a statement. I mean, it's a complicated statement that we can kind of peer into the internal structure of with quantifiers or whatever. Um, but it's a statement. I mean, we could translate it into truth functional logic using just a P. But this isn't the best right here. This is not the best that we can do for translating it. And the reason why is, look at this predicate uh, EX. X is a thing everyone who is hungry wants to eat. Um, that's a lot to bake into one predicate. Um, and we end up not expressing so there's a relationship between um uh this here this predicate and this one right um it seems like the the everyone who is hungry well uh that's everyone who is hungry in our schema is represented by you know this universal quantifier and this y right so uh if we want to really fully examine the structure of the sentences like these, we need some way of showing the relationship between y and x that is kind of hidden in a predicate like this. So, um, again, this isn't awful. If I told you to translate this into monadic schemata or a monadic quantificational schema, that's about the best you could do. Um, but it, we lose some of the relationship between the Y and the X here, uh, between those who are hungry and the things that they all desire to eat. 
And that's a problem because certain sorts of arguments um, in real life um, will turn on relations between things. Pretty much every interesting sort of proof or argument in mathematics is going to depend upon that. And not just that, I mean, you know, um, without polyadic predicates, we can't even express things like X is the father of Y. So instead of having a monadic predicate for E here, um, uh, we can express it better with a polyadic predicate. Uh, and remember, a polyadic predicate is something like uh, it has two variables, and it asserts a relationship between those two variables. So uh, instead of our, you know, X is a thing that everyone who is hungry wants to eat, we're just going to say that for this predicate E, X, Y, that means X is a thing Y wants to eat. Right, um, and if we were to do that, then we could rewrite this in a way that captures the structure, the full structure of our sentence, and that would be E, X, Y, right? So again, let me just read this. Oh, wait, that should have been X there, sorry. So I'm not going to forget to write the variables by the predicates. I'm really sorry about that. Um, we'll never have a predicate without a variable, so if you see that, I've made a mistake. So how I'd read this is uh, there exists an X uh, such that it is a pie and it is made from apple. If it is a pie and it is made from apples, then for every Y, if Y is hungry, then uh, Y wants to eat uh, X, right? And so what that says is that if there's an apple pie, everyone who is hungry wants to eat it, right? So uh, this gives us kind of amazing expressive power, whereas before we were limited to sort of very simple, representing the internal structure of very simple statements. Uh, this allows us to represent um, a wide variety of interesting statements, um, you know, in many sort of, in, that we would say in everyday life and also ones that are technically important for um, reasoning formally uh, about a given domain of knowledge or what have you. Um, but there is a price we have to pay for this, and the price is that we cannot employ the method of existential conditionals to any schema that contains a polyadic predicate like that. Um, we can only apply the method of existential conditionals to schemata that are composed solely of monadic predicates, so, you know, like fx or gy, right? Ones that only take one variable. Um, and so that sucks uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, but uh, I guess the main reason that you guys will think it sucks is because we have to learn a new validity test in the last chapter next week. Um, but... Yeah, for right now, I'm just going to give you um, some examples of uh, how we would translate some polyadic predicates. So what I'm going to do right now is uh, so take the uh, understand the predicate f x y to mean x is friends with y. Um, Right, uh, and sometimes the order is going to matter here. Um, so in ordinary English, we might, uh, you know, assume that to say that, uh, like, I don't know, Obama is friends with Biden means the same thing or says the same thing as Biden is friends with Obama. And quite possibly that's true. Um, friendship might be a reflexive relation. That's what we call it. But not every relation is like that. So the order is going to matter, um, as you'll see in some of the other examples. But I wanted to start with something simple, that you've, a predicate you've encountered every day. So uh, I'm just going to, there's literally nothing else I can do as far as I'm aware to help you learn how to do these and just give you a bunch of examples. Um, so what this says uh, 
I'm, I'll translate it into colloquial English. Everyone is friends with everyone, or more technically, uh, for every X, uh, for every Y, X is friends with Y. It follows from this that everybody is also friends with themselves. Uh, okay. And so what this says is everyone is friends with someone. Or again, more technically, for every X, there exists a Y such that X is friends with Y. Another way of translating this might be uh, everybody has at least one friend. Um, again, once we get into polyadic predicates with stack quantifiers, there are a bunch of different ways these go to and back from English. Uh, I mean, they'll always end up with the same quantificational schemata, but we just have a bunch of ways of saying these in English. So, and the, the, if you vary the order of the quantifiers and their type, it changes the meaning. And uh, this one says, someone is friends with everyone. Or at least one person is friends with everyone, or there exists a person who is friends with everyone. Uh, technically, uh, let's UD people. Because um, we don't really care. Like, rocks don't have friends, obviously. We don't care about them in our universe of discourse. Um, if we have two existential quantifiers, uh, oops. This one would say, uh, someone is friends with someone. Or um, at least one person has at least one friend. Uh, or there exists a person who has friends that exist, or something like that. Uh, so. We can also, you know, we can have something like this. And this would say, someone is friends with themselves. Themselves? Themselves? I'll give like half a bonus point to anybody who emails me the correct grammatical usage. Like, is themselves what you'd say there? Is it themselves? Anyway. Uh, so, yeah, this says, someone is their own friend. <laughs> Or uh, someone is friends with himself. Um, right? This would say, I guess, everyone is their own friend. Right? Um, or everyone is friends with themselves, then this one would say um, everyone is not friends with themselves, so no one, no one is their own friend. And um, this one, because of the quantifier equivalencies you learned a few chapters ago, uh, or last week, I guess, says the same thing. Um, and I guess I didn't, uh, there are a few other combinations that I didn't put in the book. So, uh, if we wanted to say kind of 
no one is friends with anyone else uh, or you know no one has any friends I guess And we don't really need the parentheses here. I don't know why I was doing that. I think I did it in the book without thinking. Uh, no one is friends with anyone. And it, we would read that as for every X uh, and for every Y, it is not, or I don't know why I did that. No. Sorry for the stupid typo there. That's what that should be. Uh, I would go edit these if I had more time, but I don't. Right. Um, all right, never mind. Sorry, I really screwed that up. I mashed two things together. Um, so just forget what I just wrote. I'm, edit that out if I can try to remember to find it. So uh, if we wanted to say um, no one is friends with anyone, it would be... that uh, for every X and for every Y it is not the case that X is friends with Y so no one is friends with anyone or no one has any friends or something like that would be an acceptable translation um, yeah so these are kind of the basic uh, possibilities more or less I might be forgetting one or two but I think we'll be able to figure them out of how the quantifiers um, and the order of the quantifiers and the number of the quantifiers can change uh, the meaning of the polyadic expression. So um, there are a lot of math examples in the textbook, which upon reflection might be a little too complex for people who aren't good at geometry. So I'll go through some of those, but um, let me just, so if we want to say Trump has no friends, uh, which is probably true, um, we would say, well, there are a few different ways we could do it. We could say that there doesn't exist anyone uh, that is friends with Trump. Right, um, and the T here, remember, is a free variable, and we're stipulating it to refer to Donald Trump. Uh, equivalently, you know, with the quantifier negation, we could say uh, everyone is not friends with Trump. Right? Um, yeah, uh, and we can these can, you know, be combined truth functionally with other things. So if we wanted to say uh, if Trump has no friends, then he is sad. Right. Uh, and we would say that, you know, uh, if, if there doesn't exist, or we'd write that if there doesn't exist any X that is friends with Trump, uh, then... Trump is sad, right? Uh, SX for X is sad, right? Um, yeah, so uh, I'll probably just post a video where I have a bunch more examples of these. I'm going to go through some of my math examples from the textbook because I don't think they're that bad, at least some of them. Um, and this shows why logic is useful or could be useful, right? So... Um, a bunch of these are from Euclid's Elements, which is kind of, he's the ancient Greek uh, mathematician who invented geometry, uh, more or less, or first was the first one to formalize it. So PX, where X is a point, uh, RY for uh, Y is a part and the, the letters in the translation key don't matter. I could do X's for all of them. Um, 
doesn't really matter. So for CX, Y, uh, X is a part of Y. Uh, or X is composed of Y. Right. Uh, and so hopefully you all remember this from like middle school geometry. A point has no parts. Um, or uh, alternatively, I guess, uh, a point is not composed of parts. Um, and so one of the ways in which we would translate, could translate this is Right. Um, yeah, so uh, for every x and for every y, if x is a point and y is a part, um, then x is not composed of y. Um, we might be able to get rid of this. There might be a simpler translation without the part predicate. Uh, if, we, if points aren't composed of anything. Uh, but that's... Close enough. Some of these could be a little, cl a little cleaner. Some of them might have superfluous terms or whatever. Um, so that's one way of translating a point has no parts. Um, OK, uh, so let me just write out this key real quick for the next one. O, X. Okay, so our translation key reads OX for X is an obtuse angle, AX for X is an acute angle, RX for X is a right angle, uh, GXY for X is greater than Y, uh, LXY for X is less than Y. So um, if we want to say an obtuse angle is greater than a right angle, Um, one of the ways in which we could say that is uh, for every x and for every y, uh, if x is obtuse and y is right, is a right x is an obtuse angle and y is a right angle, then x is greater than y. Right? Okay. So uh, I'm going to erase that just to make some space because the next one uses the same key, right? Uh, I think that should make sense if you read it out in logic ease. Uh, so uh, obviously the other one we could do is an acute angle. Is less than a right angle. Or the angle of uh, the, the, whatever. Yeah, that's close enough. I don't want to try to come up with something that's insanely precise here. Probably sound ugly. So uh, for every x and for every y, uh, if uh, x is acute and y is right, then um, x is less than y, right? Uh, just some more mathy examples. Again, these are all from the book. Um, so nx for x is a number. 
uh, g x y same thing x is greater than y okay and if we wanted to say uh, no number is greater than itself one of the ways um, and because of the the quantifier equivalencies and the rules of passage from the last chapter there may be a bunch of different ways of writing this there's not necessarily one uh, correct answer in this they'll all all the right answers should be equivalent to each other but they might look different um, and so one of the ways in which we could do this is uh, for every X if it's a number, then it's not greater than itself, right? Um, or, you know, if we wanted to use an existential quantifier, there doesn't exist any x, there doesn't exist an x such that uh, it's a number and greater than itself, right? Uh, and, you know, just to show you that the equivalency transformations work for this. If we wanted to get from this to this, it's just uh, then to Morgan's. So um, I'm just illustrating to you that our equivalency laws all still apply to this the way you might think they do. Ta-da, so they're equivalent. Um, see how they can look really different, but um, and possibly even more so than previously with quantification of schemata, they can look very different but end up being equivalent, right? So uh, suppose that we wanted to say we have this predicate i x y for x is identical to y. Um, and if we wanted to say everything is identical to itself, um, how you do that is for every x, it's identical to itself, right? Uh, <laughs> the last one from the chapter, you should take a look at on page 116. I don't want to write it out, um, but uh, I translated the expression, there is a point between every two non-identical points on a line, uh, and that's a pretty simple English sentence, but if you look at the quantificational schemata, the schema that corresponds to it, it's pretty brutal. Um, and yeah, so uh, I'll post a video with me doing more examples of these, but I think that this actually gives you enough, especially focus on, uh, look in the book for this table of, whoa, uh, the, the friends predicates, right? Because I think these are the ones that um, you need to look at to figure out how the quantifier order um, and the type of quantifier changes the meaning. Um, so if you look at this and try the exercises, nothing on the any of the learning practice of the test is going to be harder than the exercises. So look at my examples and just do your best, please. Uh, again, I, there just aren't super precise instructions there. So that's about it for chapter 14. Um, next week, we have the last chapter. I know there are two more weeks to the class, but I'm going to two weeks uh, for the last chapter, basically, um, and then review. So uh, again, study the examples for this. I don't think they're that bad. And uh, good luck. See you all next week.